Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing our series, Dumbfounding Definitions, Dizzying Distinctions, and Diabolical Doctrines, a series sorting through some of the jargon of philosophy. In this video, in honor of Bernie Sanders dropping out of the Democratic race, we're going to be looking at what is socialism. Now, socialism is a challenging position to define, as there is substantial disagreement within self-described socialists as to what specific positions are required for belief in socialism, and which governments count as socialist. In this video, we're going to cover three kind of eras of socialism. Utopian socialism, as called by Marx, Marxist or scientific socialism, and democratic socialism. We'll look at the contrast between them and some arguments for and against each. So, socialism is, at its heart, a philosophical position about morality and justice. However, it relies heavily on economic theories and is driven by underlying economic realities. And the arguments for and against it are going to be based a little bit in economics. Therefore, to understand it, we need to include just a little bit of the history of economics and some of the interplays between philosophy and economics. So, in economics, a business requires arguably two inputs, labor and capital, though technology is the structure with which labor and capital work, but for now, let's just Think of it as labor and capital. Capital includes things which are used to create the product, a factory, land to grow things, the initial investment, etc. Labor is the workforce that operates that capital. In traditional, non-feudal agrarian societies, individuals often own both the capital, their land, and the labor, their work to till that land and produce food. And so, if you own your own land and are tilling that land, you are able to reap whatever benefits you get from that land, but also have the risk of, if you don't have much of a crop, you may go hungry. However, as farm productivity increased, we had something economists would call agricultural transformation, where fewer people were needed to create the same amount of food, so you didn't need as many people farming the same land. One person could farm land that could feed several families, and so that freed up later labor to migrate to cities frequently and work in more productive factories, where you would increase broad productivity and economic growth within a country. Now, this new life had many benefits, including cheaper food. If it takes fewer people to produce the food, the food comes at a lower cost, and so it's cheaper for everyone. Not everyone has to work for their food or actively in the agricultural industry to get food. And you had many more things to buy because you had people working in productive factories that were able to create all sorts of new objects that could not only make food production more productive and faster, but could make all aspects of life better. However, it meant that the industrial laborers, laborers no longer owned the capital and therefore could not reap the profits. While if you just have an agrarian society where you have a family that collectively owns the farm and all of the people in that family are needed to work the farm, you have as much labor as you have capital in the hands of individuals. But when you have a factory, you usually only need one person to own that factory and that institution, but a lot of people to work in it. So this led to profits being consolidated in the hands of the newly mentored owners of the capital, or capitalists. Whereas on your farm, because you owned the land, if you produced extra food, you would get those profits from the extra food being produced. In a factory, if the factory makes a hundred times more widgets than it costs them to make and they're able to sell those, the individual laborers don't suddenly get paid more. They might get bonuses, but they don't necessarily get paid more. Those profits originally accrue to whoever owns the capital, whoever owns the factory, whether that's shareholders in a market or an individual that's made that initial investment. As Adam Smith said, wherever there is great property, there is great inequality. For one very rich man, there must be at least 500 poor, and the affluence of the few supposes the indulgence of the indigence of the many. Excuse me with the basic idea that through development you're going to necessarily get rising inequality, even if you're at the same time getting rising standards of living for everyone. 
Now, the first wave of socialism is largely just a reaction to these monumental changes in society, moving from agrarian to kind of industrialized society. The many disparate positions in this were critical of capitalism and the new inequality that existed in society. They imagined keeping kind of the close social bonds and communal ownership of agrarian living, while also reaping some of the benefits of the new technology that allowed for factories and new things to be made. People would care for each other in the same way, communal way that they did before, and the good of the group, n not just their own well-being. American transcendentalists, who we will cover in an upcoming video, we covered transcendentalists earlier, and we'll cover American transcendentalists soon, had some such ideals and started some such utopian communities. These positions were lumped together and critiqued by Marx and Engels as quote-unquote utopian visions of socialism, and frequently, if not always, failed for a range of reasons. Um, and so we're an ineffective method of reaching kind of that socialist goal of the labor sharing in the profits of the capital. So Marx claimed to be a proponent of a more scientific socialism. He provided a stronger economic framework, arguing that labor produces surplus value, the amount of value above and beyond their wages that accrues to the capitalist in the form of profit. In other words, if it takes you half your workday to make an item that can be sold for your full day's wages, minus the cost of materials, then any labor that you do after that is surplus, that surplus labor is the value that goes directly to the capitalist. The value of that labor goes straight to whoever owns the company or owns the factory. In other words, as the labor no longer owns the means of production, the capital they were able to reap the benefits of their labor. Basically, when labor no longer owned the means of production, they were unable to share in the profits of that production. All of the surplus labor went to the capitalist in the new form, in the form of profit. Now, Marx argued that this was a moral issue, that labor was being robbed of the fruits of its work by the owners of the capital. He also argued that this would inevitably lead those without the capital, the proletariat, to rise up against the capitalists, the bourgeoisie. Broadly, socialists of this period claimed that the current system was broken, that a new system where everyone shared in the fruit of capital could be created, that it would take, that it would be such an upheaval to do so that it could only be done through revolution, and that such a society would explicitly not be driven by nationalism or racism, but by a kind of universalism or a universal humanism um, that was more about a class war than a war between individual nations, that was saying we should unite as many countries as we can because it shouldn't be about disagreements about different ethnicities or these kinds of things or different nationalities. Rather, it should be the workers, the labor, rising up against the capital to claim what is in this position, rightfully theirs, the fruits of their labor. A position glorified in the quote, workers of the world unite. Now, the third wave of socialism is often called democratic socialism. This wave rose after the fall of the Soviet Union. This movie, movement claimed that the USSR and other current governments, such as that of Venezuela, were never really truly socialist republics because they weren't real democracies. If they were not democracies, then the means of production were not in the fact returned to the hands of the people. They were given to the state. And if the state isn't owned by the people in an important way, then those people don't actually share in the profits, just whoever runs the state does. If they're not real democracies, the means of production were not in fact returned to the hands of the people, just turned over to a new bourgeoisie who claimed to be socialist in order to prevent the masses from rising up. A great way to say, to convince people not to rise up against you in a new form of revolution is to say that, no, we're exactly like you. We are the proletariat. We are the downtrodden masses, and we're just trying to get by with the rest of you. Rather, they would, rather the democratic socialists 
instead of these countries would point to countries with very strong social safety nets today that are strong democracies, such as the Nordic countries is a classic example, as at least partially socialist, or at least going in the correct direction of having a true democracy that's led by the people, but also all of these kind of socialist or state-run enterprises, such as the healthcare system or the education system, and so on. For this group, the third wave of democratic socialists, the question is less of an attempt to completely overthrow the existing status quo, though they often talk in the rhetoric of revolution, but rather a debate around what services are best provided by the government and what services are best provided by the private sector. In this way, democratic socialism is more a direction on a spectrum of public opinion of public ownership than a single position or governance structure. So if broadly democratic socialism is of the opinion that both the state should be democratic and be accountable to the people, but also the state should own more means of production than it does right now, this position can be made to make some sense. That's not to say that there aren't democratic socialists that think that the state should own everything, but rather to say that there are some people that identify as democratic socialists who aren't saying that we should have entirely state-owned enterprises, but rather who are saying we just need to move in the direction of more things being owned by the state and having a true enough democracy such that the state is truly accountable to the people. So think of it like this. Democratic socialists are arguing that whatever society they are in is too far right on the spectrum below. Some may be arguing that complete state control of all industries is what's required, but that's unlikely in the democratic socialist movement. Orthodox Marxists that fall in that second category are arguably arguing much more in that vein of everything needs to be owned and controlled by the state. Democratic socialists are much more willing to say, eh, let's do a moderate version of this socialism. Most are simply arguing that some industries which are not currently in whatever society they're living in, run by the government, such as maybe healthcare, education, or housing, should be owned and run by the government. So. Let's give some examples to make this make a bit of sense. So at the far left end of the spectrum, you have complete socialism, everything run by the government from jewelry stores to pet stores, everything. This is something where you might find kind of your orthodox Marxist, your second generation socialism, the scientific or Marxist socialists fall on this end of the spectrum of saying everything should be owned collectively by the state. On the far right of this spectrum, you have complete capitalism. This is saying that the state should not own any means of production. There should be nothing that is socialist. Now, many people who are anti-socialist may say, oh, that sounds great, but there may be some worries with that. This means that the government doesn't do anything. There's no army, no firefighters, no police, meaning individuals must hire their own protection against everyone, and they must build their own roads. If you want to go to the store or go to purchase something from one, someone else, you need to have a, your own road built from your house to that other place. There's no kind of public goods, no means of production are owned by the government. Now, most people, I think, would say that either end of this spectrum is generally undesirable. I don't know how to build a road, but I also am not sure that the government should be running jewelry stores or providing everyone with a pet food allowance. So I think there's some intermediary in between that more people would find acceptable. So let's look at some moderate versions. So in terms of moderate capitalism, you have a situation where the government own, runs perhaps only the most basic services, protection and infrastructure, but not other things like public schools, hospitals, parks, running safety laws and regulations, utilities, etc. This is saying that we'll take some of those things that we do think should be government run and give the government means of production for building roads, for running the military and making bombs. It's important to note that moderate capitalism, people that fall in that category, are socialists about some things. They do believe the government should own the means of production of the police, of law, of the army, and national defense. They just are confined the number of things that they are socialist about to a small set of things. On the other hand, you have kind of a more moderate socialism, where many luxury items are run by private businesses, but services necessary for living, such as food, housing, health care, as well as public goods like infrastructure and national defense, are run by the government. Once again, this is far on the left end of the spectrum of saying most things are owned by the government, but there are some things that we shouldn't be socialists about, that we should be capitalists about, that should be privately owned and privately run because of some of the issues with complete socialism. 
And so the point on this spectrum here is that almost no one is completely 100% capitalist, barring some extreme libertarians believing that even the army and the fire department should be privately owned, as privately owning an army runs into a range of problems of when you have competition between armies, usually it's not price competition, it's competition with weapons. However, few people think that the government also should be in the business of making luxury items like jewelry or pet food, or that every single business should be completely state-owned, even if you don't have those businesses in place. All but the most extreme kind of Marxist second-wave socialists. And so most self-affirmed capitalists are socialists when it comes to the military, just as most democratic socialists are capitalists with respect to gold rings and luxury items. And so the question is not, are you a socialist or not? Are you a capitalist or not? The question is more, what things are you a capitalist about and what things are you a socialist about? What things fall better into the category of being run by the free market and what things fall better into the category of being run by the government? Democratic socialists, unlike the Marxists, are also more open to the way in which a government might own the means of production. So to understand this from kind of a public policy standpoint, the direct government means of the government runs everything. Every single person that works in the factory is a government employee that is being paid by the taxes that they get and so on, is the full-throated direct government where the government runs every aspect of an operation, is not the only option from the perspective of democratic socialists. Alternatives include using tools such as government contracting, where the government contracts out work to a company and companies compete for those contracts. So you have a certain element of that competition, but once a com company gets that particular contract, they're the only one that's allowed to do it for the extent of that contract. And so you don't have some of the issues of constant competition that may give rise to problems in certain government things and the government's subsidizing it to a certain degree such that it is actually done even if it's not profitable. You also have things like giving grants to fund research instead of the government conducting it themselves, um, continuing to own the infrastructure of a utility, so not saying that everyone needs to build their own separate power lines because if you have a power line built by every single company, it's going to be quite problematic. You only need one set of power lines, but you may want to shop out who is the actual company that's running the utility because that being completely government run has the same problems of inefficiency as complete socialism on the end of the spectrum. Um, hiring a company to do the day-to-day -day operations, therefore becoming profitable and managing prices and such. Um, allowing public land to be used for logging but ensuring sustainable forest practices are in place. Or public-private partnerships where both a company and the government share some of the profits of the venture. So these are just a small range of some of the different ways that are not direct government that democratic socialists are open to that the Marxists are not. So democratic socialists are more moderate position, but that doesn't mean that they're not pointing in that direction. They're saying that we should be running things through the government and that a lot of these things should be done through some method, but they're much more open to the methods in which those things are run by the government and the state owns those means of production. Whereas the Marxists and the second wave of socialists were much more involved in kind of that direct government, everything top down needs to be a government employee. The point is that if someone is a democratic socialist, it does not necessarily mean that they want the government to take over all private businesses tomorrow. Though there may be some self-identified democratic socialists that do believe that. Rather, they're likely claiming that some means of production should shift from private to public hands. Whether that is the means of production of healthcare, education, or jewelry will depend on the individual. And exactly how that shift happens, whether it's in the form of contracting, direct government, public-private partnerships, and so on, once again will depend on the individual, which is why these terms are so difficult to define, because each individual has their specific kind of policy platform that fits into it, and socialism is just kind of the direction you're going. You're saying more towards public ownership, less towards private ownership, whereas the capitalism is in the opposite direction of more towards private ownership, less towards public ownership. But in the same way, the capitalist rarely is saying that everything, everything, everything should be owned privately, because that gets you all these transaction costs and all these other issues. 
So, the most obvious objections to utopian and Marxist socialism is simply that they fail to accomplish their goals of actually having everyone share in the fruits of labor. These this objection, and there's a range of other objections that people have leveled against kind of Marxist and utopian views of socialism, and I'm not going to get into them all here. But this struggles, however, to counter the democratic socialist who claims that these are not real examples of socialism, but rather they were authoritarian, non-democratic bureaucracies merely claiming to be socialist in order to appease the masses. So what objections then can be raised for the democratic socialist? Well, there's some obvious objections you can raise for the democratic socialist that sits far on the left of the spectrum around the saying that the government should control and own everything. Capitalists often argue that competition leads to higher quality services and drives down prices. And there is empirical evidence to support that. Whether or not you believe it, it's up to you. I'm a skeptic. I don't believe anything. So there are obvious reasons that there's a problematic argument on the capitalist side for services such as the police or the military, where competition leads to war or no rule of law, or in the phrasings of economists, would increase transaction costs, the cost of doing business, which inevitably increase prices and make it harder for everyone to do what they need to do. However, it's more persuasive, the capitalist argument is more persuasive for something like a computer or a cell phone, where competition does seem to drive down prices and increase quality without leading to outright war. Without competition, there is less incentive to innovate or provide high quality service. And so the question is, whatever concept you're looking at, does it look more like the police and the military, who are very clearly on one end of the spectrum, or does it look more like a luxury good, like a gold ring or a fancy pet food for your dog? Whichever end it's closer to may be an argument one way or another. Now, economists use different arguments around kind of what's a public good versus a private good to try to distinguish and parse those things. We're not going to get into the difference of public good and private good right now. But those are some of the arguments the capitalists might use to piece apart. Is this really a, something that should be run by the government because it will make it less efficient and lower quality service and lower price? Whereas the democratic socialist will say, is this really something that should be run by the private market? Because that will mean that you have a range of issues of competition when you shouldn't have competition because it's a natural monopoly or all kinds of things. However, as shown on the spectrum, while most people think you should not be able to pay the police to get away with murder, most people also think that the government shouldn't be in the business of making jewelry. The real question is something that lies in the gray areas in between. Is healthcare the kind of thing that the government should provide? If so, how much? What about education? How much? Should college be completely paid for by the government? What about grad school? There are economic arguments on either sides of these issues, but all of that is beyond the scope of the video. And if you're interested, we will do more videos on kind of the crossovers between some of these philosophies and economics in the future. Let me know in the comments below. Um, what do you think? Should the state control any of the means of production, like the military, the police, firefighters? If so, you're at least a democratic socialist about a few things, at least if you think democracy is a good thing. What about this? Do you think that private industries should be in charge of anything, like jewelry or luxury goods? If so, you're a capitalist about some things. You think that the market is a better tool for some things. So broadly, the point here is that people that affirmatively say, I'm a capitalist and I believe in capitalism and socialism is bad, odds are they think they're at least a socialist a little bit about some things. They think the government should be in charge of some means of production. And people that affirmatively say, I'm a strong socialist, I believe the government should be in charge, probably don't think that about everything. What do you think? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. I don't know. I don't know what's right. I don't know anything. That's what makes me a skeptic. Watch this video and more here at carnades.org and stay skeptical, everybody.